Welcome to the National Newspaper Publishers Association's Let It Be Known. 13 Republican state attorneys general have sent a cautionary letter to the CEOs of the 100 largest U.S. companies highlighting the potential legal ramifications of using race as a factor in employment practices. The letter follows the recent Supreme Court ruling striking down affirmative action in higher education. It has stoked fears that the court's ruling will extend to corporate America. Today, we speak with Judith Brown Deannis, the executive director of the Advancement Project. How are you doing, Judith? I'm good. How are you? Well, hey, another day. Another day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Judith, I know that the Advancement Project does some amazing work. And when you get decisions like this from the Supreme Court on affirmative action, uh, first of all, what is the initial reaction and, and how difficult does it make your job? Mm -hmm. Well, my initial reaction to the Supreme Court decision was no shock, <laughs> no yeah. surprise. We have a conservative majority uh, and they have been whittling away at affirmative action for a long time. I think it's really important um, that we understand that this was um, this was a strategic hit job on affirmative action. Um, there are cases that the right and the conservatives keep bringing over and over again to get the right plaintiffs and the right judges to strike it down. And so this has been over and over again. You know, if you think about it, years ago, there was the, the case that was the Michigan, University of Michigan. Um, so I tell my daughter who um, was, she was nine months old when we stood in front of that Supreme Court um, for the protests around that case. And that was 2003. Um, she's getting ready to go to Michigan in the fall, transferring there. Um, and like, so we have to understand that this was not, this is not a one-off. Right. right. And what they've done is that they've also changed the strategy to get to use Asian Americans as their um, as their test case now. And so um, it's not surprising. It's been happening for a long time. It was the Baki decision back in the 70s, 80s, rather. Um, and so this has been a long trajectory. Uh, yeah. Justice um, O'Connor said 25 years and they said we ain't waiting for 25 years <laughs> we have you know they're like we have the majority now and right. so they decided that this would be the opportunity so no surprise well, um i think it makes everybody's job harder because it means that that schools are going to be rolling back their their diversity Mm -hmm. um, it means that for like an organization like Advancement Project in particular, that um, we'll probably see fewer black lawyers, right, mm -hmm. coming out of law schools. Um, so we're really kind of where um, schools are going to become, or predominantly white schools, right, are going to become more um, exclusive. And that's mm -hmm. happening at the same time that they're erasing our, our history by getting rid of with the book bans and the and getting rid of all the diversity initiatives. So as I mentioned at the top, these 13 Republican attorneys general uh, wrote a letter to Fortune 100 CEOs. And mm -hmm. uh, it's really interesting. And, it, and it's the direct response to the affirmative, affirmative action decision of the Supreme Court. And I'm going to dissect it just a little bit, not the entire letter. It's just yeah. like a <laughs> 10 page uh hazard to your brain, but uh, here, this, here's a little bit. Racial, here's what they say, quote, racial discrimination in employment and contracting is all too common among Fortune 100 companies and other large businesses. And in an in, inversion in of the odious discriminat discriminatory practices of the distant past, today's major companies adopt uh, explicitly race-based initiatives, which are similarly illegal. So that essentially what they're tr trying to persuade these Fortune 100 companies mm -hmm. is to get rid of any type of um, right. scenario where they would hire a person of color or a minority uh, individual mm -hmm. uh, to certain positions. Right. And right. so it, it, the it, court they kind didn't of say that. The court didn't say that. The court's right. talking about higher ed, right? And so mm -hmm. what this is, 
is that this is an excuse to um, to go back to all white everything, right? <laughs> um, and for those companies that were not committed to diversity, um, this is their opportunity to say, okay, we're we're getting rid of those programs, right? But it's not just diversity. Here's the other thing: is that in the in the Supreme Court, like it, the affirmative action cases in higher ed, there was a moment in which the courts moved from the fact that that affirmative action was really a remedy for discrimination to instead saying it's about diversity and the need for diversity mm -hmm. in higher education, right? These companies, right? Yeah, they need diversity, but they also still need the remedy for, for hiring discrimination, right? Um, like we know all the all the cases that have been brought around um, what or the studies that show that like if your name is a particular name that indicates that you are black, you are less likely to get an interview, right? There's exactly. enough information out there that the, the workplace continues to be a place where if your hair is a certain way, right? That's why we have the Crown Act passed in places. And so um, people need to understand that this was not about employment. If they want to make mm -hmm. it about employment, they got to bring the cases to show. Well, that and that's, about. and that's, ex yeah, exactly. And they seem to be pushing that. Um, we saw too, um, and the attorneys general who wrote this letter uh, also sort of, um, not sort of, but they, they did note that they suggested strongly that DE and I programs um, um, that employers may have might constitute a form of discrimination. And we saw too that position, DE and I positions um, are already looking like they're targeted. Shortly after the Supreme Court decision, um, it was revealed that three prominent studios and the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences had gotten rid of their top diversity executives, including the position that they created just last year uh, mm -hmm. to uh, create more diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, so we, we have to be careful because you're absolutely right, obviously, that this decision was about college admissions. Uh, admissions. However, we see where uh, many are trying to push this. Yeah, I mean, again, like this is like them doing what they always wanted to do, right? It's like, go back to all white schools, all white employment, all white, you know, so th th again, this is an excuse. And if mm -hmm. there's a corporation that has decided that actually they, they never really wanted diversity, they did it probably, you know, after 2020, because George Floyd was murdered, and there's a so called racial reckoning, and they're already getting rid of it because they didn't have the commitment in the first place, right? It was it was just a placeholder, right? So yeah, I you know I think we're gonna see a lot of that, um, but we're also gonna see you know companies that are saying no, we're all in because we understand the importance of diversity in our workplace. We understand the importance of diversity in the marketplace, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're selling stuff to people, like. We need all people at the table to give us the best ideas. Yeah. I was reading something too, Judith, about the Brazil's um, affirmative action, affirmative action in, in Brazil and its federal universities. And, and it says that um, their policy requires every federal university to reserve at least half of all seats for students from certain groups. Out of that half, about half of the seats go solely to Black and indigenous Brazilians. The other half go to low income uh, public school students. Other universities are also free to set their admissions uh, policies. But of course, um, in Brazil, they are concerned too, just like mm -hmm. uh, we here in America about what the high court is going might do there. Right, right. Well, I mean, it's, you know, that, that in particular is like way gone out of our system, right? <laughs> because that would be considered a quota system, right? A quota, God right. Forbid, God forbid you have quotas, right? There's quotas and then there's goals, right? And employment in particular, they use a goal system. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this, this is uh, the other thing to understand is that fascism and white supremacy don't just exist here, right? <laughs> that there is a spread across the globe of fascism. And so um, it's not, you know, we will see it in Brazil, we've seen it in other places, right? And so yeah. 
I think that also just means that we as um, as voters, we as participants in this so-called democracy, we as activists, et cetera, have to keep raising our voices um, against these against these things and make this the norm, right? Like, yes, we do need diverse workplaces, right? It's um, it's just it's important to doing business. Um, schools need diverse student bodies. You know, I think about like I went to the University of Pennsylvania undergrad. And I went to Columbia Law School. I'm sure that affirmative action was used to get me in. And, and that's not because I was not qualified. Because that's a, right. because affirmative action is not about lowering the standards, right? It is about using a system of saying, you know what? We don't have enough people that look like this in our in our in our school or who come from this background, et cetera. And so, you know, affirmative action helped get me in. It sure as heck did not help me get out and graduate and get that diploma. Um, but we, you know, that is um and and like I brought something that was important, I think important to that school. I laugh about like Columbia Law School and how. Every time I would raise my hand, I could see a lot of the white kids rolling their eyes like, oh, God, here she goes. She's going to talk about race again. And I was <laughs> talking about race in law school because my professors, for the most part, were not talking about race. And we're reading cases that are like steeped in racism and white supremacy. And we ain't talking about the underlying context for the cases. So, you know, that um, what I could bring to that conversation that my white counterparts could not was, I think, important. And those people, you know, going to be judges and attorney generals and all that kind of stuff. So I hope they learned a little something along the way. <laughs> well, you mentioned lowering the standards, which affirmative action that does not do as you aptly uh, put. But an argument can be made that what does lower the standards is these who get in because yeah. uh, of endowments, their their uncles or legacy. fathers' yes. legacy. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I mean, this is, you know, this is the way we uphold white supremacy, right? Is by giving white privilege, right? Like, let's not, as, also, this is other things people start calling that, well, that's a white people's affirmative action. No, that's white privilege. It's not affirmative action. It is white privilege, right? And that's the way in which um, we maintain a um, system of white people on top, right? Because, you know, like if your granddaddy's name is on the side of a building, yeah. I, you know, I know at Penn, we had a lot of those. And I can tell you, they weren't very smart. Those, the grandchildren were not very smart. <laughs> um, so, you know, this, and mm -hmm. that's, and that is not what, you know, that's not what they look at. It is mm -hmm. like literally, you know, I remember even on college applications that my daughter's phone out, they ask, like, you know, did you have somebody, you know, in your family that went here? Well, why is that important? Really? Right. Why? Like, why? Um, and, you know, I know that these schools look to see and how much did that person give in terms of money, right? Because mm -hmm. it's about these, are you know, institutions that rely on the money of alumni. And so, um, you know, if you even for me, if I gave money to Penn, I'm giving my little hundred dollars. Right. <laughs> Meanwhile, the white folks are like putting their names on buildings because they like paying for a whole building to be built. Right. So <laughs> my legacy ain't going very far. Uh, so, you know, so it relies also on the you know, that system also relies on the racial wealth gap. Um, that is due to discrimination in employment. Right. And it just allows you know, the continuous accumulation of wealth and privilege to white people. So how do how do we remedy this uh, remedy this um, within the community? Um, obviously, um, the federal government now is very limited. Uh, the government itself is limited in what it can do. The Supreme Court mm -hmm. is the law and made the decision. Right. What yeah. what can we do as a community? Well, I think, um, number one, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, an increase enrollment in HBCUs. <laughs> Can they handle it though? I mean, that's a question, right? That means that there should be probably more money going towards them. And I, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see attacks on HBCUs in a real, like, strategic way, right? Right. I'm um, saying that that's actually discrimination. While we know that they're historically black colleges that were set up as a remedy for discrimination because. We couldn't attend white schools, right? Um, and so I think, you know, I also think that pressing on, you know, if you're an alumni of a predominantly white institution, 
you know, we need to be, you know, fighting to make sure that they do what they need to do to to continue black enrollment at those schools. Uh, well, but, so that yeah, means I'm, use our alumni, you know, just uh-huh. the way that the other alumni are being used. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but going back quickly to to HBCUs, will we now see a a heavy white applicant base for HBCUs? Well, I mean, I think, you know, HBCUs are already seeing some white students, right? And, you know, I, I yeah, I, I think so. But like not everybody's going, you know, like white folks don't like to be in the minority now. <laughs> we're, 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 you know, so I don't know that we're going to see a whole like influx, you know what I'm saying? Like, but what kind, what, where does that put Okay, so where does that put an HBCU decision maker, who, whoever makes the decision enrollment, where does that put them? They turn down a white applicant. Isn't that that doesn't that get to be more dangerous now, be um, and or, or less dangerous because of affirmative action? Well, I mean, I think you know, I'm not in the admissions business, so mm-hmm. I want to add that to my first disclosure, right? Um, I also think that um, HBCUs are looking for particular kinds of students. That's not you know, I mean, it's not just race, right? But like, do you understand our history? Are you committed to like black empowerment? Are you like, there are a lot of other factors um, that I would bet they consider in admissions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's gonna be interesting. Um, I've, I've heard so many uh, discussions about HBCUs and, and and we briefly just touched on it here as far as whether or not they'll be able to um, you know, contain or or even uh, be able to, um, um, you know, accept the type yeah. of enrollment that might now come their way because, yeah. you know, this ruling by the court. Right, and they and and most of them have been under resourced for a very long time, right? Um, and so yeah, it's gonna it may be, um, a struggle, but you might see more people stepping up to invest in HBCUs also. Right, alumni who actually do have money, or other people who didn't go to HBCUs that know the importance of the role that it plays. And I think this is the other thing about HBCUs is that while we're seeing this, you know, kind of like the decrease in the number of students at predominantly white institutions, we're also probably going to see an uptick in um, in racial incidents on those camp, uh, racist incidents on those campuses, right? And that students of color may not feel as comfortable going to those schools any longer because it may become a hostile environment for them. So you may see more, you know, black students in particular going to HBCUs to be in an environment where they don't have to deal with that, right? Which is like, we saw the uptick after 2020, right? Like Mm -hmm. young people were like, you know, I don't want to deal with that, right? Like, like this is, you know, I want to be someplace where I can learn and just not have to deal with the with racism on campus or racism by the police, et cetera. So I think there'll be um, good reason for young people to seek out those opportunities. Yes, it, it, the way you describe it too, I mean, it's so on point, but it also sounds like uh, we're going full, doing, doing that circle again, Jim Crow, yeah. reconstruction and all of yeah. that. Um, <laughs> And that's because, you know, that's because, I mean, white supremacy <laughs> um, readapts, right? And it, and it, and it's like, basically, like, they're like, y'all, y'all have gotten too far. Wait, <laughs> hey, you've gone a little, you know, like, you're, 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 you're gaining too much, yeah. right? And the demographics of our country are shifting, right? The browning of America means that whites, the people who practice. And isn't that the and, biggest fear? Yes, that is. That is, this is what 2045, right. I guess, is the estimate. Right. And, that, and I want to say this is uh-huh. fear, not as in fear that I'm scared, right? Like I'm scared, like, oh my God, but like fear as in like the loss of power, right? right. The loss of privilege. Like I don't want to lose my privilege, right? And be like, you know, outpaced by these others, right? And so I think there's, um, that's what's driving, you know, that's what's driving voter suppression. That's what's, I mean, all of, that's what's driving like the whole criminal narrative, right? It's like trying to put us back in our place. Mm-hmm. And, and it also seems to indicate, we talk about, about this a lot. We have guests, we have other journalists come on this program and talk about this a whole lot, Judith. And that is the long-term um, unwavering strategy uh, of Republicans as opposed to 
Democrats who seem to plod through, plod through while Republicans are, you know, in other words, it seems that Democrats play checkers and Republicans continue to play chess. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're on the, we're on the defensive a lot. Um, and they have a lot of money to move their, their, their ideas. Um, they want to take us backwards, right? Like you think about mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade, like they were plotting that for a long time. Since and they, since so, they instituted it. <laughs> yeah. Right. And they just, you know, they just kept going after it. They kept bringing cases. They kept passing legislation. They do take these like ideas of like, okay, what is the, what is the right that we want to undermine and then they're just going to go after it and stick with it for a long time um but that's also what you can do when you have privilege right <laughs> when you don't yeah. have privilege you got to fight for the scraps you got like like we need you know we need health care we need you know like it's like that kind of thing that you're like you know always fighting to 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 get the next thing to protect our people right mm -hmm. and that's um the defensive posture is hard and it's hard to like when you're on the bottom of a society it's actually hard to have the long vision and like keep with it i mean it is what we need but it's also that we have to have people that invest in that over the long term and that's not what we have yeah it seems to really um underscore some of the things that agitates the black voter doesn't it mm -hmm. right right Cause they leaned on a lot. They lean on heavily yep. every mm -hmm. election. Yep. 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 And, um, yeah, we are, we are, <laughs> but you know, we also understand, um, the importance of it. I mean, you know, I think I'm worried about voter fatigue and things like that in 2024. Um, but I also think that, you know, we don't have time to be on fatigue. Like mm -hmm. there's like, there's no option in in that right because so much is at stake if we haven't learned how much is at stake over the past couple of years with the loss of affirmative action the loss of the right to abortion like that like even the loss of like student loan we, you know the debt repayment like that was you know that was out there biden you know did what he was supposed to do and who attacked that yeah. Republicans and they took that to the Supreme Court, and 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 it should have never been in the Supreme Court. But the Supreme right. Court, those justices were doing the job that they were sent there to do. They were protecting Republican ideas. Yeah. And before we let you go, Judith, the um, advancement project. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about um, whether in the vein of affirmative action or anything else you'd like to tell us uh, that folks should know more about. Uh, the advancement project? Sure. So, you know, we are um, a next generation racial justice organization. This issue around affirmative action is important to us because we do work in the area of educational justice, K through 12 education for students of color, um, that we know is important to this idea to have an opportunity for higher education. And we still have not solved the problem of separate and unequal in this country, right? And so that's the work that we are trying to do to make sure that every child has access to um, a high quality education. We also um, do work around, we have a, a campaign, a national campaign for police free schools. And that's because not only are our children not getting um, high quality education, but they're getting criminalized in school and arrested in school and assaulted by cops in school. So the same police officer we worry about in our neighborhood is in the school hallways. And so we have to be worried about that. We also do work. The other thing that's, of course, important here is our work around um, voter suppression and fighting voter suppression, because, again, this is um, right now we are at a battle um, for our democracy. Right. And who are we going to be as a country when we grow up? Right. Are we going to be an inclusive democracy that um, that actually people of color who will be the majority have the power that matches our numbers? Or are we going to be still acting as the political minority? And mm -hmm. so um, we have lawsuits, for example, in Georgia and in Florida around the voter suppression laws there um, and do work in other states um, with groups on the ground, people who are really in the fight on the front lines of these issues. So and you can find us at um, www.advancementproject.org. 
There you go. Judith Brown, Deanna Sweet. Really appreciate you as always. You. Always dropping gems for us at the <laughs> press. We appreciate Thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. All right. And we go to some headlines, folks. Um, a history making heat wave that baked southern uh, U.S. communities with triple digit temperatures uh, over the weekend will offer little relief this week and could spread dangerous 